Welcome back to the Roundtable. I'm Osric Vox, and cartoons are a wonderful, wonderful thing. But how do you make them? Well, recently, a Tumblr blog making tunes has given us insight on the world of animation. How do things work in the modern day? How does someone go about getting a cartoon? Well, one thing they wanted to know is that all studios and productions are different. This is not a concrete explanation of how every cartoon is made, rather a generalized look at the television pipeline. That being said, it all starts with pitching the cartoon. Giving the idea. All cartoons had to start from somewhere. Whether it's an original idea, adaptation, reboot, an idea is always pitched to a network. Then it's up to the network executives and department to greenlight the idea. Now, most cartoon pitches come from artists within the studio who have already been working at that studio or in animation for quite a long time. It's nearly impossible to come in as an unknown fresh face, pitch to the network, and have your cartoon made. So not everyone can be an Olin Rogers and get Final Space off the ground. Even studio interns who are encouraged to pitch their ideas almost never get anywhere. Executives feel safer knowing that the person pitching has been familiar with the studio for a long time, and that they know what sensibilities the network is looking for. Now, most pitches are presented with a pitch bible. It usually includes a plot synopsis, character bios, themes that are explored in your show, examples of what the show would look like, and short episode ideas. It's also beneficial to have a short storyboard at some point, to really sell the mood and characters you're going for. Now, more often than not, if you get past the first stage, you go into the second stage. The pilot. Unfortunately, even if your idea is in development, it can be years before the gears start turning to actually get it made. Look at OKKO, okay for example. That pilot was made in what, 2013? And the full series didn't start until 2017, last summer. That's four years! Probably even longer because who knows when the pilot itself was actually finished. Some people are lucky to get their stuff moving right away, but others have been waiting a while without any peep from the network. But let's say your pilot goes straight into production. Great! This is where you'll have your first experience as a showrunner. A showrunner is typically creator of the show, who more or less acts as a supervisor on the entire thing. It's a stressful job, not for the faint of heart. So it makes sense to make that short pilot first. You can get a sense of the job. And executives can see how that person performs as a showrunner. It'll be more or less as running the full-time show, but with a smaller crew. Now, there are a lot of things that can differ from short production to a full cartoon release. There might be design issues, unclear guidelines, unfocused character motivations, and other problems that may not have been clear from the pitch, but are now rearing their head in short production. Now, because a short is relatively low risk compared to full production, this is where mistakes have to be made in order to find the most efficient and cost-effective way to produce your cartoon. This is why a lot of cartoons change drastically compared to their original short. Look at Steven Universe, OKKO, OK even Gravity Falls. Alright, after your short is made, where does it go? Does it air on TV? Uh, that's another factor that varies. For example, Infinity Train's pilot aired on Cartoon Network, while Steven Universe and OKKO's OK pilot remains exclusively online. But most of the time, they're gonna stay internal, meaning the general public will never get to see them. Guys, just imagine how many pilots we have not seen. Think of every cartoon that's out on TV right now. Have you seen their pilot? No. But you know it exists. Now, even after your short is created, there's a lot of executive mailing that needs to be done before they decide to go with it as a series. This depends on sort reception, both on the studio side and the general public if it got released. Once again, Infinity Train, how someone performed as a showrunner while the short was made, and a bunch of other factors. But let's assume you got lucky, and your cartoon got picked up. Where do things go from here? Well, pre-production. Starting with writing, you might have your cartoon all figured out in your head, but you're not perfect or infallible. It is impossible to spearhead a cartoon all by yourself. So before you start thinking about storyboarding and character design, you need to get yourself some writers to flesh things out. As a showrunner, you usually get to pick who you hire, and usually you're gonna pick your friends, or writers you know are good that might be looking for work. Alright guys, this is my personal opinion as Vox. We're going to something as big as a full-pledged television production. Maybe not hire your friends just because they're your friends. Make sure you know they actually have the chops to handle such a project. Anyways, once you have your writer's room, you gotta figure out stuff such as the overarching story. Not the entire thing, but a good idea of what will happen over the course of, say, the first season. Any seeds you want to plant now for down the road. Just a basic story structure. Maybe some episode ideas. It may have been your pitch bible, but it was maybe five episodes at most. Write an outline for some episodes. That'll help immensely in the future, which we'll touch on later. Also, be sure to write episode premises that work with your show and its time restraint. Also, character arcs and motivations. What goals do your characters have? What pushes them forward? 
Then there's character design. Now you can't go willy-nilly and add 5,000 zippers like a Kingdom Hearts character. Your character design can't be too complicated to animate. You want to make sure that the studios overseas have a grasp on what your characters look like and that drawing them is fast, fun, and easy. So you want to hire someone who is extremely good at making characters that are going to be drawn by other people. Someone who either has been working in the industry for a while or who is incredibly good at understanding shape language. You gotta make sure it's someone who you can trust and who's skilled. And again, don't hire your friends just because they're your friends. There are a few more things for pre-production, but they go hand in hand with actual production. Hiring staff, whether it be background artists, coloring stylists, storyboard revisionists, etc. The best way to find people for the job is to give them a storyboard test, a short assignment that gets sent to an artist to see how their skills will translate to the show. Beyond tests, portfolios are also a really big help. Sometimes artists only get based on their portfolio. And let's say you're on the other side. Let's say you want to get a storyboard test. The best and most surefire way to get tests is knowing someone in the studio or show who can put in a good word for you and recommend you. Unfortunately, if you are an artist, in the eyes of a network and a showrunner, because they don't know you, you can just be Tumblr fan artist 594. Unless you're immensely popular in a fandom, it may be hard to stick out. However, do not harass professionals on Twitter looking to get your foot in. Do not befriend someone only to reap the benefits. Do not start a relationship with someone when your only goal is to get them to recommend you. Do not mention someone you don't know ask them to get a test. Guys, 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 essentially, don't use people. Be a good human being. How would you feel if you are on the other side of that? Come on. Anyways, once you got your crew together, you gotta figure out, is your show gonna be board-driven or script-driven? Now, with board-driven shows, the writers just write the premises and the outlines for the storyboard artist. The storyboard artists are responsible for the dialogue, fleshing out the episode. The storyboards carry the episode. Steve Universe is one of the most popular examples of a board-driven show in modern times, although maybe not for the best of reasons. A lot of people like to believe Steve Universe does not have writers, but they do. I'm not sure of the current ones, but for the longest time, that title belonged to Matt Burnett and Ben Levitt, who now both showrun Craig the Greek. But shows like OKKO okay and Service Force of Evil are also board-driven. Now there's also script-driven shows, where the writers route the entire episode, including the dialogues and actions, and the storyboard artists interpret this script into the actual boards, without having to write the dialogue or come up with certain character behaviors, like Rick and Morty or the current seasons of Spongebob, although the show used to be storyboarded. Gravity Falls is also another great example. You want to create the episode outline, which is basically a whole episode written out in moments, with certain details left vague. There is little to no dialogue written. The outline should more or less be a sketch for what will become your episode. It should be malleable enough to be transformed by your crew, but specific enough that the ideas conveyed in the outline stay in the final episode. After you get the outline, you begin storyboarding. As a boarder, after you get your outline, work starts immediately. You gotta figure out how the episode will play out with your board partner, and you both try to pick sessions to storyboard. Normally, you try to split it 50-50, but sometimes you may lose track of time, and someone ends up doing 60 or 70, but then maybe your partner will pick up the slack on the next episode. Typically, a board artist team gets five weeks to produce a finished 11-minute episode. Sometimes it might be six weeks, but most shows do take five weeks. Outside of this blog, this was even stated on an episode of the Steve Universe podcast with Lamar Abrams. And again, Every show is different. Some shows dedicate more time to thumbnailing. Others like their boarders have ample time to clean their storyboard. But what consists of a storyboard? Well, sequences, scenes, and panels. A sequence is a period of time within the episode that takes place in a single location or it conveys a single idea. An example could be Adventure Time, where Finn and Jake are sitting around the treehouse talking about farts or something. After the sequence is done, the episode has moved on to a different location, where Finn and Jake are talking about something else. Within sequences exist scenes, also known as shots. A scene consists of a single camera shot where something moves or pans, but never cuts. And yeah, no one in the animation industry actually knows what they call a shot scenes, even Owen Dennis, showrunner of Infinity Train, has made a joke about this on Twitter recently. That's why if you ever look at the behind the scenes of storyboards, they'll be on scene 100 or something. You'll be like, whoa, wait, what? But no, that's just the actual shot. Now, a panel exists within scenes and is a single drawing by the storyboard artist. So if a character's expression went from mad to happy, it would take separate panels to draw out the mad face and then the happy face. I believe I just mentioned thumbnails earlier. they are very quick drawings that, in essence, exist only so you can map out where a character is in the scene. These drawings can range from literally stick figures to something that is detailed enough to be used in a final episode. Since the drawings and thumbnails had to be done super quick, some storyboard artists draw a shorthand. A shorthand is a drawing of a character that is recognizable by shape and size, but not by any detailed features, and can be drawn extremely fast. Along with thumbnails, board artists will also write dialogue and specify which actions will take place throughout the episode. And again, how long board artists stay in a thumbnail phase depends on the show. For example, on regular shows, storyboard artists spent three weeks doing their thumbnail pass on an episode before their first pitch. Now, 
Now, what's a pitch? A pitch is where the board artists present their episode to the crew. There are usually two of these per episode. In the first pitch, usually only the showrunner and writers are present. After it's done, they critique the episode and add notes and corrections. These can vary from adjust this one scene and add this dialogue to please rework this entire sequence and you write the second half of this episode. You never know what you're going to get. After the first pitch, the storyboard artists go over their thumbnails again, this time adding the notes they got and making any corrections that they needed. At this stage, after the corrections are made, the boarders present the episode a second time. And this time, usually all the boarders join in to watch the episode get pitched. Usually, there aren't too many edits to be made after the second pitch. So after this, the boarders go back and make the drawings pretty, making sure they draw everything super clear. Back to regular show, board artists get three weeks for the first thumbnail pass, after which they do their first pitch. They then get one week to address their notes, after which they do their second pitch. And then their last week is spent doing cleanup. The reason regular show doesn't get a whole lot of time to clean up is that the show's focus is more on good writing and jokes and beautiful drawings. So boarders are given more time to flesh out their ideas, rather than making sure every inch of Mordecai's body is drawn perfectly. Contrast to this is Craig of the Creek. While it still retains focus and good writing, they also want to make sure the show is relatively on model. Because of this, boarders only get one week for the first thumbnail pass. Drawing an entire 11 minute episode in one week, after which is their first pitch. Then they get one week to make corrections to their second pitch. After that, they get three whole weeks for cleanup. So Craig the Creek's drawings would be more realized and cleaner than regular show. But this doesn't mean that one way is better than the other. It's simply different ways to make a show. So after the storyboards are all said and done, everything's finished, they go on to the voice record. It's time for the voice actors to, well, voice the episode. The showrunner goes to the recording studio and together with the voice director, audio engineers, and a couple of production people, they go through the board with the actors and record the lines. Not all voice actors have the same schedule, so sometimes multiple records are needed to have an entire episode be voiced. And even then, there might be slight changes or edit lines to an episode after they are recorded. Then there's animatic editing. Once all the lines are ready, the animatic editor takes the board panels and, working with the timing director, puts together the episode's animatic. An animatic is basically the storyboards turned into a movie file, with timing for all actions accounted for. While in the animatic stage, it's easy to spot places in the board where more poses are needed, sometimes more lines are needed, or shots need to be changed to satisfy screen direction. So after the animatic has been reviewed and all the changes and notes have been made, the episode gets passed to the storyboard revisionist. A storyboard revisionist implements small changes within the episode that can range from stuff like reframe the scene wider to something more labor intensive, like please redraw this entire sequence's poses and add some more to make the action readable. In addition to revisions, there are also additional voice lines that may be added after the animatic review. These are called pickups, and it usually involves voice actors coming back to the studio to record a couple of lines to add to the episode. Next up is design. Once the episode is boarded, timed, and voiced, it's time to design it. Now design is not this person's forte as they know, but they do their best to explain what they do know. Background design and background paint. Every episode needs backgrounds and sets for the characters to be in, and it's up to the background designers and painters to make these spaces. For example, Steven Sugar, Rebecca Sugar's brother, and yes, Steve Universe is named after Steven Sugar, designs a a lot of the backgrounds you see on the show. A background designer takes the rough layout drawn by the artist and clarifies it into a line drawing. The background painters take this line drawing and paint it to match the show's palette and a scene's mood. Along with backgrounds, additional characters also need to be designed. The character designer makes the model sheet for any new characters that appear in the episode, even if their role is insignificant. Character designers basically take the rough board drawing and clarify the character into a solid model sheet. Board artists do some of the work by designing rough versions into their boards, and sometimes, if they have a really particular vision for a character, a board artist can work together with a character designer to put together the final model a model sheet contains all the information that someone needs to draw a character. Sometimes what the bottom of their shoe looks like, what their mouth looks like opening clothes, what their eyelids look like, etc. In addition to character designs, the designers also draw special poses. Special poses are certain moments in the storyboard that may need a little attention to make sure they're clear for overseas anime. So the designers do a redraw of the storyboard to be more on model and more specific. Next up are color stylists. Color styling is a super important part of the process, but it's often unknown to many people, including crew members members themselves. In fact, there is currently a movement within the industry to make sure color stylists get paid as much as their design co-workers, since there's been a wage gap for quite a long time. Color stylists set the characters' palettes for the characters, props, and effects within an episode, taking into account lighting, taking into account lighting changes that might happen while said elements are on screen. For example, a character wouldn't be colored the same in broad daylight than in complete darkness. Last but not least, we have props and EFX designers. Every object that a character touches and every puff of smoke or falling leaves that might show up in an episode all need to be designed. The work never ends for designers. After design is said and done, it's time to outsource it. So a lot of people might be under the idea 
idea that every episode you see of every show is animated by that network in-house. This is actually not true. It might be true if it's animated in Toon Boom or Flash, but most cartoons get animated overseas in South Korea. There are several animation studios in the country, and they are employed by almost every US-based studio you can think of. There are exceptions, as there are animation studios in other countries, but either way, most shows' animations get outsourced, as it's cost-effective for the studio. To make sure the animators have all the materials they need, the production crew digitally sends them all the storyboards, mile sheets, reference, and anything else that they might need to animate the episode. This is commonly referred to as shipping. No, no, not that kind of shipping. Making reference to when materials were physically shipped to the studios, before the internet became widely available and passed them to take on the file sizes of today. There's work print assessment and retakes. After a good couple of months, anywhere from six to nine, and after getting back a couple of animation tests from the studio, the entire episode gets sent back to the network. Well, the episode usually has some mistakes that need to be correcting. That's why the episode in this form is called a work print. The episode is fully colored with backgrounds and everything, but it's missing sound effects and music. But this is where things get tricky because fixing any animation mistakes means the animators have to work again, which means the studio would have to pay them for fixes. Since this show has a limited budget, there's only so many fixes that can be made to one episode. So with limited resources, how do you choose which things to fix? Nine out of 10 times, the things that get fixed are moments that are important to the story, a joke, or things that ride way too awkward to put in an episode. The part that sucks is that if you make a lot of mistakes in important moments, you might be only able to fix so many of those, leaving other awkward moments within the episodes unfixed. These fixes are called retakes. Referencing that redoing a certain shot means doing a take too. This takes us to post-production, which the person who made this blog stated they know little about. Compositing. Compositing refers to any combination of elements that form a single, unified picture. In the context of cartoons, adding certain effects to a scene, like snowfall or rain, or minor touch-ups done to the episode, is compositing. Most crews have an on-site compositor that partakes in this process throughout every episode. After compositing comes audio mixing. Audio mixing involves putting music and sound effects into the episode, knowing at what volume and how exactly the sound should play in order to harmonize with the picture. At some point in production, a show's composer gets the episode work print and begins working on the score for the episode. As additional help for the mixer and editor, a post-production person also makes cue sheets that indicate which piece of music fits where. After that is airing and marketing. Now a common misconception is that people think a crew or even the showrunner alone decides when or how a cartoon episodes air. The reality is, once a crew is done with an episode, they have very little say in how it airs or how it'll be marketed. AKA, all those Steven Universe hiatuses, Cartoon Network, not the Universe. there's really no argument to be had here. I see you typing, stop it! Stop believing every rant video you watch! Because a show is always running and always producing episodes, burnout is inevitable. This is what hiatuses are for. A show going on production hiatus means that the people involved with the most anticipated part of creation get to take a break after working non-stop. This is not the same as an airing hiatus, which happens when the network has decided to stop airing the show for a while. When a show goes on airing hiatus, it is more than likely that the crew is still working even though no episodes are being aired. A network can decide to take a break from airing even when they have enough content to air. It's not good practice to air every single day your crew is produced, only to pause its airing to wait for more episodes to be made. A production can also be sitting on episodes for months on end, waiting for the network scheduling department, yes it has its own department, to finally tell them when they're going to air. For example, Beach City Greens pretty much had his entire season done months before its premiere date. So to make it clear, sure Showrunners don't decide when episodes air. A production crew does not set the schedule for a show. A show doesn't decide whether or not their episodes air in bombs. In fact, most shows just want a regular airing schedule. Those are all different departments, and your beef is not with anyone who works on these shows. Guys, it's a weird time for animation. There are apps, there are early releases, there are leaks, it's nothing like how it was before. Heck, it's not how it was two or three years ago. Now if you're more interested about a show's production, pick up an art book, Steven Universe, Regular Show, Adventure Time, Over the Garden Wall, Rick and Morty, and so much more. These shows all have art books that give you a glimpse into how their shows are made. Maybe you can spot the differences in how a show differs in different processes. But this was the general gist. Again, special thanks to making tunes for this entire article I pretty much read and paraphrased. And I hope you guys at home learned something new. I certainly did. Now, making tunes, the anonymous user who made this blog also said it is their belief that making cartoons is just another job. No one is cooler or better simply because they work at a cartoon studio. Don't put people on pedestals. And this goes the exact same thing for content creators. Please, please, please don't idolize us. I eat at McDonald's too. But what are your guys' thoughts? After learning this, do you want to work in cartoons? or maybe even your mind has changed a bit.
it. Which part of a cartoon would you want to work on? The writing, the storyboarding, the music? Drop your thoughts in the comments below or tweet them to me at AshaBots or at RoundtableVids. We're also on Instagram. If you want to help the Roundtable grow, support us on Patreon so we can do more cool things. I want to do an entire series about the process of animation in depth, more in depth than I did here, and being able to do my own research. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please sort of like, share, and if you're new here, subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications to stay in the loop of all things animation. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Ostrich Vox out. <laughs>